you know, I, I agree with you that the problem uh, in the end anti-intellectualism is, is, is probably a more general problem, and we can bring it to generalization of university support, of course, in the arts and humanities are a subset of all of that activity, and I agree with all of that. However, uh, and pardon me, but I, I have to challenge you to think about uh, resources, and resources matter. If no one, if a child never sees a violinist, chances of that individual, if he even runs across the instrument, uh, Playing the violin is not likely. If, if they never encounter a painter, uh, if they never encounter a literary, uh, uh, a person who, who uh, if, if parents don't read them, et cetera, et cetera. Here, here's my fundamental point. If you look at the last 60 years, since World War II, the infusion of capital into technological development, into the scientific uh, research arena, has been enormous. Yes. Largely through the Van Iver Bush uh, document Science the Endless Frontier, the, the institutionalization of the National Science Foundation, the NIH, followed by the DOE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on. That leads to resources, that leads to a platform, that means people can make a living by practicing fundamental research, and that has led to all this economic development and everything else that we enjoy and quality of life. That is largely absent in the humanities and the arts. The National Endowment of the Arts was probably the last big investment. No. It's not much of an investment. Well, that's what I'm saying. So when you compare it to, to 70, 80 billion dollars or so, or whatever the number is, in, in research, think about what a billion dollars could do in humanities and the arts. So uh, the, the disparity there in terms of investment, and therefore the advocates who mm -hmm. could advocate in a democracy for the purpose, and have, uh, it just doesn't doesn't follow. Resources matter. Yes, no, totally. Resources matter, and I, I and please don't misunderstand. I'm, I, I'll accept them. You know, I'm I, uh, I'm already counting them in my budget. Um, uh, it's it, you know what you say is is in a way unimpeachable. So if we had actually uh, uh, will in the public and it was politically viable. Uh, for there to be a minister of culture or a secretary of culture, and there was a big budget for music and theater and dance and, and the visual performing arts in a similar way there is for science. If that were a plausible picture, I'd vote for it. But I'm being a realist here, and I'm saying I don't see this happening, except for one area, perhaps. I do think there is a growing belief, uh, which I have no desire to puncture, that the, com the countries where we feel competitive with have all shown a correlation between their, the way their, their um, high school graduates perform on international comparative tests in science and math and all that, and the quality of the music education in those countries. Right? And it turns out that classical music is not simply a white man's conceit from the West, it turns out to be a transferable art form that with great deal of utility and there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm all through China, Korea, Japan, all through Asia, and even closer to us in Venezuela as an instrument for the betterment and uh, improvement of communities of poverty, especially with a lot of children, in El Sistema. So I do think there's a possibility to get state and federal support for the idea that if you could really bring serious participatory music education rooted in the classical tradition into schools, especially the disadvantaged and poor, you could see an improvement in performance in schools, a reduction in crime, and um, uh, a better graduation completion rate in schools. So music would be defended. Not any music, but this music, because it has certain skills. It requires participatory learning. Uh, it is complex. It's of long duration. Uh, it, is, it, it seems to be a system, like mathematics, that um, appeals to the cultivation of more complex modes of reasoning. And uh, it isn't a, a three-minute rock song you do with karaoke. So it is, it's, a, it's also eventually required literacy. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I'm all in favor of a big government investment. After Abreu in Venezuela, who created a system over 40 years, had it funded as a social program. It wasn't in the Ministry of Culture. But he was a Minister of Culture. Yes, but I think he funded it through some colleague. He didn't fund it himself. He didn't want to be accused of being a kind of cultural, um, how shall, uh, cultural uh, policy making from above. It was as an instrumental program for changing the quality of life in the community and has shown great results. So I think um, I would sell, and this and I would be unabashedly sell um, the support of education in the arts as an immensely useful thing. That if you want better software engineers and better computer engineers, you know, teaching them visual literacy, abstraction, how to paint, draw, uh, how to uh, conceptualize visually, these things through the arts uh, will pay enormous dividends. Um, and uh, so I think that's one area where we could actually might persuade uh, a government to invest as a matter of, um, of educational utility. Uh, to inspire better performance in the things we are really concerned about, which is math and science, for example, as a nation. Um, so I agree, resources matter, and you are actually more right than you think you are, because <coughs> when we think about resources, we think about government resources, tax-based resources, mm -hmm. and private resources. Mm -hmm. You can raise money for cancer research among the very rich, because they fear death. Mm -hmm. And they've experienced it in their family and illness. Um, but the rich are decreasingly people of cultivation. Their tastes are as vulgar as anybody's. And uh, their arrogance is now more supported. There was a time when the rich felt humble in front of a priest or a pastor. Uh, they believed themselves to be men of business. Uh, and they were, John D. Rockefeller was very deferential mm -hmm. to William Rainey Harper, who founded the University of Chicago, who was an Old Testament scholar. The, John D. Rockefeller today thinks he's smarter because he's richer, and thinks those of us who are not rich are just dumb. Mm -hmm. And he can solve any problem better than we can, even in our own field. So instead of giving money to the hospital, to give money to the hospital only until he, he wants to run it his way, so the new rich are less and less, in my mind, patrons of anything and use their money to, proceed to get control and reward. So in the arts in particular, uh, the performing arts, where you don't buy a commodity, as in the visual arts, where you buy, have a collection. That's not really patronage. That's a form of investment. But in dance, theater, and music, much, much of the infrastructure was developed, even in this city, <clears throat> by people who thought it was good for the city. They didn't get anything out of it, they didn't get reward, they didn't own anything. They got their name, perhaps, on a building or a concert hall. But the person who built Symphony Hall Boston was an, a rich guy who loved Beethoven. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of rich guys who love Beethoven around anymore, <laughs> or anything more remotely like that. And some of them like rock and roll, which is why they Hall of Fame of rock and roll. Um, and it's fine. So I'm concerned that not only is there a problem in public support, there is a growing problem in the patronage, particularly of the non-commercial performing arts, dance, theater, and music. But I, I think you're providing a little hope because in your comments, you have provided a kind of blueprint for ad, ad, uh, advocacy which I think has probably been lacking in, in this particular aspect of the intellectual pursuit. And I think your blueprint of uh, the broad educational mind, the impact on the child, the decision-making, leadership qualities, judgment that it provides uh, in, in terms of a competitive life, for lack of a better term, which we're all concerned about, I think that blueprint could, could work. So, um, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I've had experience the last couple of years now with El Sistema. I've conducted their orchestras in Caracas. I'm taking one of their orchestras to Tokyo. And, um, you know, seeing those kids, you know, kids who are 18 to 25, mm -hmm. and you talk to them where they come from, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that the tradition of collective singing and playing 
uh, with a high degree of excellence and a tremendous training that has residual life benefits. That these kids will be better lawyers, doctors, businessmen, whatever they end up being. They, most of them won't become professional musicians by any means. Um, so um, it is, uh, but the most important advocacy is to persuade, and I think that scientists are, are our best allies. If you take away the narrow meanness of spirit that um, academic departments seem to develop in the nature of things mm -hmm. and uh, against one another in their competition for resources, if you can step back from some kind of uh, aggressive competitiveness, they will absolutely concede that we need to work together to develop the, the motivation uh, in undergraduates and in high school uh, to, um, to take on you know, serious intellectual problems and realize that we're allies uh, in the development of a new generation of better STEM professionals and, and that the key is to try to get to the student at early adolescence. I have to think that trying to motivate them in graduate school is too late. And certainly in college is too late. Mm -hmm. That we're missing the best years. We have a, a large experiment all over the country in early college where uh, we end high school early and college starts uh, effectively uh, in the 11th grade. And this is very effective and it's, it's embedded in the high schools. We have two public high schools in New York, which we run, one in Newark, we're about to open one in Cleveland. Um, we have one center in New Orleans, and um, we're in touch with Baltimore and Washington to do this as well. And this is uh, tremendously effective, because in my view, given the developmental patterns of young people today, that um, getting them at, at, at the end of middle school is crucial um, to rekindle the the motivation that they naturally once had as children. And uh, by the time they get to college, it's a little late. And I think we're missing the boat. Uh, so a reinvestment in education, which, of which the university is a central part, uh, is probably a cause that could be put forward. I would have expected. Uh, my dream had been that when the president was elected in 2008, that the natural stimulus would have been to follow in the footsteps of Abraham Lincoln and um, refinance the entire state university system all through the country. The moral act of uh, yeah. the modern moral you do a, more, a new moral act. Re refinance the entire state university systems mm -hmm. throughout the country. It would be fair, everybody would have understood it. It would have been a tremendous act of stimulus. Um, because that's the future and um, for the country, both economically and I think politically. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it didn't happen. So maybe someone will come up to it, um, this idea, in the next go around. Because um, frankly, the revival of the American university and cultural infrastructure uh, has to be, in that sense, you're totally right, uh, has to be funded by government. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be funded by the private sector. 